So thank you very much, Clint, and, and thank you all very much for, uh, for, for joining us today, uh, and that's in my capacity as a director of CEDAR. I'm delighted to be uh, director of CEDAR, and the company Pulse, as an example, is, is you, you couldn't get a better example of the contribution that CEDAR makes with you in, uh, in this country in terms of economic development. So, so thank you. Let me also uh, add to uh, the acknowledgement of country uh, and let me also acknowledge that we meet on uh, Aboriginal lands and pay my respects to Indigenous leaders and both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island leaders past, present and emerging. Um, it's great to be here it's very rare that I get the opportunity to be on the stage with Melinda, and it's a particular highlight today to be with Melinda. They don't let me out much uh, in CEDAR. They keep me behind the scenes. Uh, but uh, I'm, I am absolutely delighted to be here and joining you. And as I've heard a few times, how good is Queensland? That's what I've heard in, in my travels uh, from Minister Andrews, and uh, certainly we all heard from the Prime Minister. But how good is Queensland? It's great to be in, in Queensland. Um, I've got two hats, one as a board member and as, uh, another as, as Clint's mentioned in Innovation and Science Australia. I chair that board. It's a board of entrepreneurs, uh, of researchers, of investors, of educators and of industry people. And our, we, we support Australian innovation, science and research. Uh, from three perspectives. We advise the Australian government on innovation and sci science and research policy. Uh, we monitor and oversee innovation programs like the Cooperative Research Centre program. Uh, so we actually have a statutory responsibility to see that those programs are administered appropriately. And also, very much in the spirit today, is we stimulate public discussion about innovation and science. And so that's why I'm really, really pleased to be here and to confront the topic, uh, the, the, the findings of the company, uh, of the Community Pulse uh, survey, particularly in those areas of R&D and of technology investment. So if we look, uh, and as, as Melinda's covered there, um, business places a very high level of importance on R&D, and see, they see that as a key component of remaining competitive uh, and resilient in their own enterprises, and the combination of competitive and resilient enterprises means that we have a competitive and resilient uh, economy. Uh, international competition is increasingly important in the world uh, that we live in, and as uh, the economy has developed and the world economy has developed and markets have developed, we've moved out of a, an environment where products and services were generally short and in sh short supply to an environment where there are many, many options for all of us. And generally, products and services are abundant. If you ask anyone from the service industry about the level of com competition in their sector in terms of competitive offers, etc., they'll say it's higher than ever before. And therefore, differentiation and degree of fit in the nature of your product and services, service is particularly important for you to be competitive. And increasingly, it's in intangible things like degree of fit, trust, uh, customization, uh, feel, and all of those characteristics that increasingly determine the competitive frontier uh, for businesses, whether you are in services or you are in uh, are in t more tangible products, but it's the intangible element, and that's the link to R&D, really. At Innovation and Science Australia, we've been asked by Minister Andrews to do a piece of work in relation to business investment in R&D and innovation, to look at what's happening in that space and what are barriers, what more could be done, what are some of the issues there. We've, we've done a detailed quantitative analysis to look at the levels of and we've also looked at, in a quantitative sense, in all states uh, with interviews with businesses to look at the quantitative factors like uh, managerial capability, mindset, uh, competitive strategy, uh, etc. Et, et and interestingly, that if you look at Australia's business 
investment in R&D, round figures in the last financial year, it's about 16 point, nearly $17 billion. Business investment in innovation, which is not R&D, but is things like business model, business process, development of capability, new product test, and those things that don't fall naturally into an R&D definition, is at least as big again. And so the total is somewhere between, according to Alpha Beta, somewhere between 32 and $38 billion, of which 16.7 billion is R&D investment, which is, tends to be closer towards the research end of the technology readiness scale. And the moral of the story and what we've looked at is correlations between that sort of expenditure uh, and the impact on businesses and their competitiveness. And so what's interesting is that we found in there that businesses invest in both R&D and non-R&D innovation demonstrate better business performance, revenue growth, job creation and resilience in comparisons to the, uh, comparison to those who do one or the other. For example, using data from zero insights, zero published data when they analyse de-identified of course, but they look at the population of businesses that, that use their beautiful software, uh, and then they look at the gr correlations between certain investments and expenditure and growth rates. And interestingly, and not surprising to me, but the level of differential is surprising, that small and medium businesses that accelerated their IT adoption, so I'm in non-R&D innovation area here specifically, those who were above the median, and the median was 2% of revenue, so small and medium businesses that spent more than 2% of their revenue on ICT investment and adoption, grew at three and a half percentage points higher, that's 350 basis points higher, that's their revenue growth, and their employment growth grew at five percentage points higher than the median and those lower than the median. So there's something that's clearly correlated there. The degree of causation is something we will all have to look into, but it says that there's something very, very powerful about non-R&D innovation and the impact it has on revenue growth and employment growth and given that those are the two key elements cited by our federal government in terms of the strong and robust economy that's the number one of the three objectives, it seems like we've struck on something that's pretty important. So very little attention has been placed on non-R&D innovation. And I, far be it from me to encourage you to get stirred up about the R&D tax incentive, but the R&D tax incentive and the fault line on that is exactly at the point of where software-related expenditure is it and is it not. And yet we see from that data how significant it is for the 97% of businesses that are small and medium size in Australia. So it's a very important thing. The other data we have, which is not quite as clear, but ASX 200 businesses that, again, are beyond the median in terms of investment in non-R&D innovation, are, again, more, growing faster, employing more, and are more resilient in competitive terms than those which are not. So it seems like there's something, this is something we should be paying a bit of attention to, uh, to us at Innovation and Science Australia, and we're certainly putting our report together, which will be delivered to the government uh, by the end of October. The findings of the report, however, on the business side, show that business understands this in R&D, and we didn't ask non-R&D, but next time I hope we will, Melinda, uh, or you will. Uh, in that process. But the concerning thing is the gap between the business view of that, which generally understand the importance of investment in R&D, and I could go to technology as well, because there's about the same dimension of gap, that somehow the community generally don't see the same importance 
in R&D investment and let's call it technology investment as do uh, our business leaders. And realistically, that's, I think, a pretty significant issue for us as a country because if the nature of competitiveness in today's world largely comes through intangibles about timeliness, trustworthiness, uh, and the characteristics of the products and services that we have that are largely intangible, that means that there is a disproportionate impact of software in delivering that game and the platform business model, which seems to be the, the, the killer app of the world. If you look at the rate of growth in market cap, revenue growth and employment in businesses that are asset light, they offer a platform business model and their systems are architected to generate increasing levels of customer loyalty. Those businesses, you know the names of them, you would have subscriptions with most of them, I'm sure, both in Australia and internationally, then those characteristics are things that we seem to have in the community, a disconnect with the power of those, and also maybe a lack of clarity as to how important they are, recognising R&D and non-R&D investment uh, is important. So I think there's something there that it is personally, uh, I, I'm a great, I'm a glass half full person, and I see that any transformation or disruption has, must have equal balance between opportunity and threat. The threat is if we don't act, it will be a serious threat. Uh, the opportunity is we act ahead of others, then we, we, we take advantage of our smaller scale because we are more agile and we can compete with countries and industries and sectors that are vastly bigger. I was reading this morning, Kim Williams spoke, I think, at the Australia-Israel Chamber of Commerce yes yesterday, and not surprisingly, he was talking about the platform businesses and big tech. Uh, and Kim Williams, if you know, was worked with News Corp for many years. He ran Foxtel. He's now an AFL commissioner, and he's a lawyer by background. And I just want to just read you something that he says that sort of struck a chord with me, which said, Industry development policy makers should take note here. In the new connected world, connected countries that are not consistently successful in innovation and productivity improvement are in for a hard landing with harsh declines in living standards. So I, I, it just seemed to sum up exactly what that is. So the issue for us is not that we have a differential, uh, the issue is how do we bridge that so that the community associates success of businesses with their success and their prosperity, and also, most importantly, we've got a government to business issue, I think there seems to be a fracture there that says government, business and the community aligned on this point, I think is a particular opportunity for us, alternatively, if we don't proceed well in this regard, I think it will be a risk for us. In a book that Tim Reed, who was the CEO of MYOB, gave me some time ago, it was written by John Brown from BP uh, with a partner from McKinsey called Nuttall. And in that book, it's called Connect. And interestingly in that book, he talks about in the early phases uh, of the early stage of the book, he talks about that business, uh, I'll paraphrase, but it's not much of a paraphrase, it's almost exact. Business has been on the nose with the community since 500 BC. And it goes through waves and cycles. And we're on a particular downswing at the moment because social media enables both employees and customers to speak about the product in use rather than us all to be dazzled by the product as it was offered or the service as it's offered to us. And the view he puts in that document is consistent, in that book, is consistent with the findings of this report. And the third piece, which I'll touch on very briefly because Nia's waving those things at me again, is this thing about fundamentally connecting with your community, your employees and your customer. And this brings this third point in the, in, in the discussion that we've had and the highlighting that Melinda's done for us so well is this thing about business leaders speaking out. Uh, again, I think we've seen from the Pulse data 
that the community are saying, we actually expect that big leader, business leaders will speak out, but only half of us believe that they're speaking in the natural, national interest most of the time. And, <clears throat> excuse me, so in that, in that topic, then I think this thing about fundamentally connecting with your community brings in environmental and social and economic that it is a part of being a business leader today and a government leader today. So I, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm bemused by views that say business leaders should not uh, be speaking out on these things. Quite frankly, we now have the proof from a broad range of Australians, whether they're quiet Australians or otherwise Australians, but thousands of them have told us that they expect it. But they want to see that it's in the national interest, and that is, I think, the first step to getting back to this trust and this relationship that business and government and business and the community will have. So just to conclude then, competition drives innovation, nothing else. Innovation, competition is the mother of innovation. Innovation is broader than R&D. The early, early findings of our work is that non-R&D innovations uh, is highly correlated with improved business performance in, rev in growth and jobs particularly, but also resilience. There's a misunderstanding of the alignment between the company interest and the national interest in both R&D and technology, and that's something that we've got to bridge because I think we're going to go nowhere fast unless we can resolve that so that we're all aligned and heading in the same direction. I think there's a concern generally around technology investment quite more pessimistic in Australia in relation to technology investment and I think we are concerned about the future of work and lot job losses from technology when the reality is that it enhances growth and enhances employment in the 2.7 billion of small businesses and medium-sized businesses we have as well as ASX 200 and I really do look forward you can see I hope where uh, my uh, colours are nailed. Uh, you, I look forward to presenting our findings to the government in this sort of area and uh, also we'll be finding ways to reflect some of the community pulse data uh, in that report to government when we report in October. I look forward to the panel. Thank you very much.